Hello, Internet. It's your old pal Doc Awesome here once again to talk to you about some video games. I recently downloaded an old favorite, River City Ransom, originally for the Nintendo Entertainment System. While it feels a little dated, punching and kicking your way through a city full of rival school gangs is still a tremendous amount of fun. It's a genuine classic, one that still frequently gets named in best of lists. River City Ransom was the first game I ever beat as a kid. And when I returned to it, I was pleasantly surprised at how easily everything came back to me. As I reached the end credits again, I had this intense feeling of deja vu. I saw these two identical moments in my life, separated by a chasm of decades. And the realization hit me that I had been doing this for a very long time. Not playing River City Ransom specifically, but all of the games like it. Over 30 years now, I have been valiantly fighting my way to the other side of the screen. And for the first time, it occurred to me to ask, why? What made this deceptively simple genre so endlessly appealing? This is by no means a complete list or an exhaustive history. I have mostly limited this to games that I have played myself or encountered in the wild. I know that there's a ton of games over there in Japan, but I never played any of them, so they are not part of this list. It all began with a single quarter. I was maybe 10 years old, attending a friend's birthday party at our local miniature golf course. After we had sunk our last putts and demolished that cake, the adults gave us some quarters and turned us loose in the biggest arcade I had ever seen. Sega Game City. In the prize position at the center of the main floor, we encountered the perfect arcade cabinet for a party of fourth graders. 1992's X-Men. It was huge, with a screen bigger than my television at home. There were six of us and six joysticks. It was an absolute delight. We played as the entire cast of X-Men, nobly fighting their way through waves of killer robots and evil mutants, rolling endlessly to the right. Every last coin went into X-Men, and the birthday boy was even able to convince his parents to cough up some more so we could finally defeat Magneto in one of the cheapest quarter-munching boss fights in the history of the genre. But it didn't matter. We were victorious! And we talked about nothing else for at least a week afterward. I knew, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that the X-Men arcade game was the most awesome thing I had ever seen in my decade of life. And it became my quest to find more like it. Growing up in the age of arcades, there was always an intoxicating sense of imminent discovery whenever you entered one. The internet wasn't really a thing yet, and there was barely any gaming press, so you could walk into any random place and find an amazing new game you'd never heard of before. One of my favorite games ever, Armored Warriors, I found on a bootleg Play 10 cabinet at a laundromat. Nowadays, we know everything about a new game at least a year before release. But back then, the general lack of information meant every visit to the arcade held the promise of a new adventure. A chance to see something awesome I was totally unprepared for. I didn't even know its name at the time but I had fallen hopelessly in love with the beat-em-up video game. The formula was simple, but effective. America. There was a good guy, and there was a bad guy in dire need of a beating. 
But before the hero can deliver, he must punch and kick his way through the villain's army of goons. Your goal, more often than not, is to reach the right side of the screen, always scrolling toward the final battle. Each level is just a conveyor belt of enemies you must fight your way past to reach a final boss battle at the end. Rinse and repeat with exponentially scaling difficulty, add in an elevator level or two, and you've got a traditional beat-em-up game. To my delight, the arcades of the 90s were full of variations on this surprisingly versatile theme. Most were brawlers featuring rad dudes beating up street gangs, classics like the Final Fight or Double Dragon series, but more than a few games added swords and a fantasy setting to make hack and slashers like Golden Axe and the King of Dragons. My friends and I dumped a lot of our allowances into Knights of the Round, a game about King Arthur and his knights fighting progressively more anime villains until you're literally dueling a giant red samurai. It's just good, ridiculous fun. Some games like POW, Prisoners of War, and The Punisher even added limited gunplay. And then there was the really weird stuff, like Ninja Baseball Batman, which is not, as I originally guessed, a game about Batman playing a fictitious sport called Ninja Baseball. Although, someone should absolutely make that game. No, instead it is about a team of baseball-themed ninjas in a surreal world that revolves entirely around America's pastime, and they are on a quest to recover some... sacred baseball relics? Most of the enemies are anthropomorphic baseball equipment like balls and gloves. There are even living baseball bats that use regular baseball bats as weapons, which you also fight using a bat. Every second of this game is more ludicrous than the last. There's even an end-level fight against a boss called Makeshift Villain. And yet, Ninja Baseball Batman makes mountains more sense than a bizarre little game called Puli Rula. Sorry if I mispronounced that. It looks like a hand-drawn anime about two children saving a magical kingdom. You play as Zack or Mel, who are given magic sticks they use to bop enemies, turning them into cute critters like puppies and piglets. But... A few levels in, things start to get... Well... Strange is hardly a sufficient word. Just... Look at this. Look at it. Look at all this nonsense. I know what you're thinking, but the questions you are having right now, there are no answers. It's like the arcade version of an incomprehensible art house film that everybody says they like but nobody can explain. There was a version of the belt fed beat em up for almost everything a kid could possibly care about at the time. Cabinets full of heroes like Superman and the Avengers. There were Dungeons and Dragons, aliens fighting predators, even forgotten failed franchises like Bucky O'Hare. Remember Bucky O'Hare? No, you don't. Konami's titles like X-Men, The Simpsons, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series featured exquisite pixel art and were so beautifully animated it felt like we were controlling our favorite cartoons. While many developers would throw their hats into the bloody ring, the unquestionable champion of the arcade floor was Capcom. While Street Fighter 2 was single-handedly saving the arcades from extinction, I was always more interested in slowly punching my way to the right. I liked the one-on-one -on -one fighting games just fine, but I was never very good at them. In a beat-em-up, there were fewer characters to learn, and the special moves, if there were any, were simple to pull off. 
and I always had more fun playing with my friends rather than against them. When we finally defeated Magneto, all of us were winners. We got to share the victory and the playground bragging rights. Many of the games I've already mentioned, Dungeons and Dragons, Aliens vs. Predators, The Punisher, Knights of the Round, were all developed by Capcom. But they didn't just adapt other properties to the format. They also developed some of the most delightfully ludicrous titles in the history of video games. Warriors of Fate sent you slashing through a mythological version of China. Final Fight sends the mayor of crime-ridden Metro City to rescue his daughter from the Mad Gear gang with nothing but his fists. Captain Commando charges you with stomping out super criminals in Metro City's cyberpunk future. I guess, even after a trilogy of games, Mayor Hagar was never able to completely clean up his town. It's a shame. Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, in addition to having quite possibly the catchiest name in the arcade, put you in a post-apocalyptic wasteland ravaged by Mad Max extras and dinosaurs. All of Capcom's games were populated with delightfully bizarre and colorful characters that fired young imagination. They were who my friends and I pretended to be when we had make-believe battles in the backyard. Among Capcom's stable of playable heroes are a stretchy man made of rubber, a sentient carnivorous plant, and a preteen girl riding on a pink punk ostrich that's wearing an eye patch. And all of those were from just one game. 1997's Battle Circuit, if you're curious. Capcom didn't invent the arcade brawler, but in my humble opinion, they were the ones that perfected it. Even their competition seemed to agree, because Final Fight became the standard the rest of the industry worked tirelessly to copy for the next decade. How many games are there about criminal gangs overrunning a city? Too many to count. Final Fight also introduced a 360 degree special attack for each character, they could knock down a bunch of enemies when you're surrounded at the cost of a little health. A mechanic that would become a standard trope of the genre. But it was more than just their tight controls and insane style that made Capcom the ones to beat. They were the innovators. Always bringing interesting new mechanics to the table. Warriors of Fate and Knights of the Round both feature mounted combat in some sections. A character on horseback can be quite devastating against the random mobs. Knights has a level up system, even if all it seems to do is give you better looking weapons and armor to provide the illusion of progression. It totally worked on me when I was 10. The King of Dragons has characters that actually level up and can acquire more powerful weapons and gear along their journey. Captain Commando has a rudimentary combo system that allows characters to chain attacks together. Battle Circuit improved upon that system and added the ability to spend in-game currency on character upgrades and new special moves in between levels. This fun experimentalism even bled into their licensed fare. Aliens vs. Predators has four characters with distinct fighting styles and a robust combo system complex enough to allow the most skilled players to not just win, but also show off. That, that's not me, by the way. The Dungeons & Dragons games have a surprisingly detailed plot for an arcade game featuring multiple cutscenes, a large cast of NPCs with dialogue, branching narrative paths, and even side quests. There's so much text in these games that they actually wait for you to scroll to the next screen. But my personal favorite, Armored Warriors. Cast you as a mecha pilot, blasting through an army of giant robots and evil cyborgs. You can even tear parts off your defeated enemies and attach them to your own machine. There's an assortment of arm attachments, gun turrets, and mobility systems to be scavenged on that battlefield. And all of them will change how your mecha handles in interesting ways. But the best part 
If you're playing with others, your mechas can combine to form a giant ultra mecha to turn your foes into a pile of burning scrap. It's basically a Gundam fighting game, and slicing robots in half with a laser blade never gets old. It's a crime. Armored Warriors never got a sequel. I discovered it years ago at my local laundromat, but after I moved to a new town, I didn't see it again anywhere. Arcades were disappearing, and the few that were left weren't carrying obscure classics. Thankfully, it was included in the Capcom beat-em-up bundle, so now I can enjoy Armored Warriors from the comfort of my home console. So that's it for the Age of the Arcades. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and come back for part two, in which we explore the console continuum.